Hallelujah. The practice, the time that people pour in so that somebody might experience or meet with Jesus. I don't think, um, and this is happening all over today, all week, there's been decorations put together, there's been floors cleaned, there's been flowers planted, there's been mulch, there's been weeds pulled, not just at this house, but all over the place. There's been songs rehearsed, there's been practice, there's been Uh, Hey, you watch the kids because I got to be here tonight. There's been preparations because of the opportunity that somebody would hear the gospel, the good news. Wow. You know, um, I'm Pastor. My name's uh, Nate Schlegel. I'm a lead pastor here, but uh, I've been pastoring here for 14 years now as the lead pastor. It's crazy to say that. Um, but I remember when I was a young man, uh, I would go over to this fruit stand. Anybody ever been over here to the Dean's fruit stand? Best watermelons, best watermelons ever over there. They have a lot of good stuff. But um, I remember when I was just a, a young man and going over there, they would say, uh, are you the preacher? Are you the preacher up there? Are you the preacher? And I was like, oh, well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm the pastor up there. He's like, okay, you're the preacher then. Yeah. And I never really had heard that before, but it kind of bothered me, to be honest. Um, I didn't like that term. And just the other day, uh, about four or five days ago, I was at at somebody's house, and they go, and I said, uh, you know, what I do? And they go, oh, you're the preacher up there? I already, I talked to you, preacher. And and I was thinking about that and and how I, I just, I am a preacher. I'm not the preacher. I'm a preacher. You know what you are? You're a preacher. See, when when it's the preacher, then we don't have we preachers. But this is what was happening all week. We have been preparing, the body of Christ has been preparing to preach the gospel. And so this is so exciting. So this morning, uh, you know, we can dress up for Easter, but how many of you know you don't need to dress up the message of the gospel? You just got to share the message of the gospel. And so this morning, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about an encounter of, of somebody who found Jesus, but really Jesus found them. How many of you ever said, I found Jesus? You've ever heard that terminology? And I know this is kind of a play on words, but really, uh, or, or maybe a mix, I'm not trying to mix words, but we never found Jesus. He found us. And we're going to look at a couple of examples uh, here this morning, uh, uh, two, two parts, the, a story in John where Mary goes to find Jesus, and then we're going to look at another uh, account of something that has nothing to do with the Easter story, so to speak, except for it's somebody that was looking for Jesus. And I, I love that. I love that idea. And you know, I think um, in, in, in preparing for, for Easter, uh, having uh, ministered here for 14 years, uh, that means uh, this is year 14 Easter. And there has been different times where Easter, I hated, like hated, because of the pressure that I would take upon myself to communicate something in some way. And I would be stressed. I'd be pressed. I'd be all like mentally in a fog. I'd be just, and a few years ago, um, I would say probably 2020. When you didn't have to go in for Easter. How many of you remember Easter wasn't in the house? Easter was at my house or it was at your house. It was, and um, so things were different. You know, we did a live service. We had the band come and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it, something changed in that time of just that quiet, quiet for, within my own heart of, of just like a, maybe the pressure off. You know, and so, but as I, as, as I was um, coming into Easter, I, I go over this pretty much the same story. And what I find is I find myself a lot of times, there's a lot of places in, in the word, but there's two places in particular that I find myself in scripture. And that's Hebrews and Romans. Now there's a lot of other pieces that play like Colossians or Ephesians and Corinthians. I mean, it's all over. I mean, we're going to go into Revelation, but, but I thought that was interesting how as I go, went through just some old notes and just refresh the story of, of, of God's goodness and his kindness and the fact that he, that I, in my notes, I just see Hebrews and I see Romans so often. 
Now, what is significant about Hebrews and Romans? Well, Hebrews, it's a people group, isn't it? And Romans, it's a people group, isn't it? It's, it's not just a letter to a city. It's a letter to a people. And I was thinking about that to the, uh, this week as I was coming in, like, okay, that's interesting. God is writing so often, and he makes things really clear to Hebrew people, and he makes things really clear to the Roman people. And really, we're kind of like Roman people or Gentile people, but he's talking to a church, or, but a church that is very much just on the outside, where the Hebrews were on the inside. They were children of Abraham. They had understanding of law. They had understanding of a redeemer, about a Christ coming. They had understanding. They, they, they didn't recognize Jesus Christ, but they had a lot of understanding. They had a lot of knowledge. And so there's this co- co- conversation that, that has happened to be written to the Hebrew people to get them back into a place uh, and, and maybe um, not, not to diminish the blood of Christ. You know, because every year there would be the, you know, you would go in. This is actually Passover. Today, we're like celebrating, it's Easter, but it, they're two different Passover is the, the release of bondage from Egypt, but it was, it, was, it, it was a product of a father providing a lamb. Did you know a father had to provide the lamb? That's what it says, that the father of the household had to provide the lamb or furnish the spotless lamb for their house and apply the blood so that, so that that family could be preserved. That's Passover, and they were brought out of that day. They were brought out of bondage into, well, Easter's the same way. The father provided a lamb, but he didn't provide a lamb over and over and over. He provided a lamb once and for all. But I'll tell you, in the church, and so I kind of think of like Hebrews as a lot of kind of like church people. The writing of this it, to Hebrews, I, in Hebrews, I see, I see it's to the Hebrew people, but I think somehow and sometimes when, we, when we've walked with Christ or we've heard the message of the gospel for a while or we've, we've maybe grew up in church or maybe we've been in, in, in the pews for a, a little, maybe too long, we can, the message of the gospel can be sterilized. It can lose its value. It can, it can be this thing that's like, uh, yeah, you know, but no, once. Jesus entered once for all, past, present, and future, and now he's there interceding for us always. And so we, it's interesting how we can fall into this place and we back into this place of works, having begun. The Bible tells us that, hey, be careful not ha- having begun in the spirit that you think you could finish it in the flesh. And I think, and because of that, we, we, we think about, so much depends on us. And so then the, the, these moments of like Jesus, like Easter, Jesus raised from the dead, the proof that he was God as man sent for you and me, our, our celebrations, they're not, they're, 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 they're not quite as on the inside. You know, you know, like there's sometimes there's those moments where you're like, yeah, but then there's other times there's those moments that you're just like, you might not even say anything, but you're just, anybody with me? Like just everything within you is just Christ. Oh, thank God. And so sometimes we're, we're, we're wanting to make a show on the outside to prove maybe to the person to the left or to the right that something is going on on the inside when it might not be. Huh? It's, it's happened. Hey, how are you? Uh, you know, like you, you, there's an outward show. And, and then we can get into that place as a church where we're looking for that to, to be made for you, for me, and instead of it coming from the heart, which produces those things. So we're going uh, to go to a couple stories this morning, um, and, and you're going to find me talking to Hebrews and talking from Romans, or talking from Hebrews and talking from Romans quite a bit this morning. And so I just kind of want to lay that foundation where, where the Roman people, it's like, Wait a minute, like you, salvation is, Romans 10, 9 and 10, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. So there's two parts involved for salvation, your heart and your mouth. What do you have to believe? That God raised Jesus from the dead. Why, why is that so important? Because that is, the, that is the declaration that he is, God came as a man. And then you have to confess Jesus is Lord. Sometimes even in uh, bringing salvation to somebody and leading somebody to Christ, uh, we get really wordy. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like we get really wordy. We're like, Paul is talking, introducing the gospel to the Romans. He's like, so if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and then you just say Jesus is Lord, confess him with your mouth, then you'll be saved. For it is with the heart you believe, but it is with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's that simple, two parts, heart, mouth, Jesus is Lord. But you can't say Jesus is Lord unless you believe. So, like, you, you, you mean I can get born again, I can get saved by just declaring me from my heart, making a declaration that Jesus is Lord? Yes. You mean I don't have to have all the pieces? No. What is God after and where does he look? The heart. The heart. And so as I was coming into this, this, this week, what was going on in my heart was this word invitation, 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 invitation. Just give them an invitation. Give an invitation to Christ. Give an invitation. Anybody ever got an invitation? And when I, when I heard that, that invitation, that word invitation, what I heard is without an expectation. See, because if you get an invitation, let's say you got an invitation to your brother-in-law's wedding, or I guess that would make them your brother. <laughs> so that would be your sister, right, that was going to become your brother. But let's say you got a, a, maybe your cousin, all right, somebody that you're like, and you had, I don't know, I don't know why I looked at you, but the master's was calling your name, okay? The masters, and, 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 and you had everything ready to watch. You had a master's golf watch party, but, and it was going to be the kickoff, and your favorite player was, and you were so excited to watch that, that event, but then you get this thing in the mail. And the masters has been on the calendar, it's every year. It's like, it's like hunting season. Don't schedule your wedding and ask me to do it on hunting opener. Hello? October 1st? Okay, all right, just throwing that out there. Um, Because I'll get this RSVP, this invitation, but with it will come an expectation, and I'll be manipulated into doing something that I don't want to do. I mean, as much as I love it, like, I'm going to lay that down, you know, for, for, but I really am not laying it down for you. I'm, it's, it's manipulative. Did you know sometimes there's invitations? This happens with mom and dad, mom and dad with their kids. You tell them, you need to be in church. Maybe you're here today because your mom said, are you going to come to church with me? But it was like, hey, will you come to church with me? But the hey, will you come to church with me? was like, if you want that ham and those deviled eggs, <laughs> you better get your butt to church. <laughs> come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been there in their life maybe you, where it's like mom said, get to church. Dad said, hey, you're going to come to church? And, and it wasn't even, uh, invitation wasn't even an invitation. It was actually like, I expect to see you there on Easter. But it wasn't an invite. But it wasn't an invite. It was manipulative. Because as long as there's expectation with an invitation, then, then it's actually controlling. Did you know God gave an invitation with Jesus and he never had an expectation for you or I? Like, you, you better, you know, you know what's right to do, right? You, she's like, yep, chicken. Sir, you want steak? Okay, steak's fine, but you'll be there. You know, circle on the invitation, RSVP. Which RSVP means respond if it pleases you in French. It's actually an acronym in French. I don't know how to speak French, but it's R-S-V-P. And I, but that's what it is. It's an acronym. Respond if it pleases you. Did you know that's how, that's how it's still how Jesus comes and he says, Hey, I'm going to, here I am. I set before you life and blessing. Whatever you'd like. Whatever you'd like. Isn't that interesting? Someone said, uh, well, did God really give a choice? Because if I don't choose life, then I just get hell. Is that really a choice? Well, you got to choose. You get to choose. Every choice has a consequence. You can either choose good or you can choose bad. Well, you're saying if I don't choose good, then I just get bad? Well, yeah, but your, your, your mental, your, your, your reasoning is flawed. Like you, you, you're not seeing the good. So why, what you're saying is all you can see is the, you, you don't even see yourself as having a choice. Anyway, so let's go uh, this morning uh, to John chapter 20, 15 through 18. We're going to jump in, and we're going to just hear, uh, just, <clears throat> this is Mary, she, she's at the tomb. This is Easter morning. He asked her, woman, Jesus is now talking to her, why are you crying? 
Who is it that you're looking for? Who is it that you're looking for? And this is what religion really is, is that we're looking for Jesus, but the gospel is that God is looking for us. That's the gospel. That God so loved the world that he came and he, he's looking for you. So the invitation is, is, is this. He, he came to, to give you and I life and give it to us more abundantly. That's, that's, that's Jesus. And so here he is looking. Uh, he said, who are you looking for? Thinking that it was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, isn't that interesting? When he called her by name. Her eyes were open. That's how invitations still work. They have your name on them. They still work that way. It's like you, you'll see people sometimes maybe at church or at an event and they're like, uh, and, and they're, they're like th- thumbing through, you know. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani or teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended into the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Woo, what a powerful, hey, I haven't yet ascended, I'm about to, you caught me, you were looking and you found me, you found me like, whoop, real quick, like as soon as it happened, right? He, she, was, she was on top of it, looking, hungry to find, loving Jesus. And she found him. And, and, and then verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. I saw Jesus. I, I saw Jesus. And she told them that he had said these things to her. What an what a encounter she had with Jesus. She saw Jesus, but she saw him maybe differently that, way, that day than she had before. She, as she went and told the disciples. And their, their response was like, nuh uh Right? How many of you know sometimes when you encounter Jesus, other people's response will be, nuh uh. But you don't have, it doesn't matter about their response. It's your response. Look, look at this. Again, the gospel that Jesus came to find us. Romans chapter 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's offering a gift for anyone who would take it. There's a gift that's through Jesus. The, it, there's a payment that you owe. There's wages, and that's death. But God has given a gift of life instead of death, so you get to choose through Jesus, our Lord. Luke 24, 46 and 47, Jesus said that, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer, die, and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent, which simply means change. I'll take that one. This is powerful. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So he's, he's making this declaration of, of well, there's something owed by you and me. There's something owed, but there's something that was done, that Jesus came and paid the price. At Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, like, is this invitation for me? Am I, I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm not as bad as the rest of them. No, 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 no. All. So every one of us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 11 through 12. He's talking, again, we're talking to the, the, the Roman people, the people that have no clue. And he says this, he says, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks the Lord. There, uh, um, it actually starts like this. There is no one righteous, not even one. And then it says, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks the Lord. Verse 12. It says, they've all turned away. Every one of us, every one of us, there is, sometimes we think we're doing pretty good. We're kind of like move ourselves over into the Hebrews, you know? Did you know that there is nobody? There's not one righteous, not one. Every one of us have turned away. We had turned away. Like maybe, maybe it just seems like such a distant memory. And, and that's where we kind of go to Revelation chapter 3, this letter to the church where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You ever you'd heard that scripture? You ever use that scripture? I have. To, to minister to somebody that maybe hasn't ever met Christ. Can I tell you that Revelation chapter 3 is a letter to a church? Did you know God stands on the door of hearts in the church? 
And right before that, why he's knocking on that door is because of the lukewarmness. Wow. On Easter, here we're having a conversation about lukewarmness in the church. Like God coming and knocking, saying, hey, what, like, what are you choosing? You, you kind of, like, you said you'd be here, but I think we're checking out the oxen and we're checking out the land and we're checking out some other things. And the Lord's like, return, do again the things you once did. Like, hey, don't, don't forget the RSVP. Like, it's, it's coming. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, your wife will remind you, like, hey, uh, that won't work. What do you mean that won't work? It goes because Friday's the wedding. Oh, okay, yeah. Got to make sure make that adjustment there. When is the wedding? When's the wedding, guys? Soon. Very soon. Wedding soon. I don't even know how this is coming out this way, but there's an invitation. Give them an invitation and remind them of the invitation. The wedding, it's soon. And God's standing at the door of our hearts and knocking and saying, hey, do again the things you once did. Do again at the beginning. This is to the church. This is to the Hebrew people, like the Hebrew. This is to where, where it's like we move it from a place of really seeing the significance of Christ. And if you, if you see, it, how many of you know when you see him as he is, you do again what you once did? When you make a decision that's not manipulative, no one has to tell me to love my wife or to do something for my wife or you should hug and kiss your wife because I love her. There's not a manipulation there. But how many of you know, like, you need to give your brother a hug and say, I'm sorry. Brother, a hug. Okay, I love you. Right? Let's keep going here. So, um, John chapter 6, 44. Do, do, we, do we realize that um, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent him has drawn him to me? What? The Lord's drawing all the time. Did you know the Lord doesn't ever stop drawing? He's always saying, hey, come hang out with me. Hey, come, come with me. Did you know no, no person here chooses God or chose him or reached out for him because they're good? There's not one person here. And we're getting to somewhere this morning. We're getting to this, this one that was looking for Jesus. But sometimes Hebrews and Romans can kind of separate. And the Hebrews hang with the Hebrews, right? And the Romans hang with the Romans. Is that true? Do you remember this in the stories? That, that like, there, you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Samaritans were bad. Or the Samaritans are good, but like, uh, not Samaritans. Yeah, Samaritans, yeah. They're, they're, they're a mixed breed, but the Jewish are a pure breed. They're sons and daughters of Abraham. Like, they, they, would, they were separate from all the other tribes. There was a separate. And, you know, I, I, that can happen in the church. Where the churches were, were, were separate from the world. And we're, we're, we struggle to even reach the world with the ministry of reconciliation because somehow we're finishing this thing that started in the spirit with the flesh. And this is an invitation to you and me to come back and remember again what Jesus came and did for you and me, how he drew me while I was so full of sin, while I was so lost. He said, hey, hey, Rodney. Hey, Kyle. Hey, hey, Chelsea. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, I just want to meet with you. I can fix that. I can heal that. I can restore that. I can bring that back together. I got a future for you. There's, there's good news. Good news. I got some good news, and that is the message of the gospel, is I got some good news for you. This is where he finds us with good news. And he doesn't look at us as being... Uh, a, completely filthy he looks at us and loves us can you uh, you remember that story uh, of the rich young ruler and I always I contemplate this often it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him that just the look of of Jesus's face could tell you that he loves you this is this, this is next passage let's go here let's go Luke 19 1 through 10 Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Maybe you've heard this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. 
climbed up in a sycamore tree. For the Lord he wanted to see. He was looking. He was looking. But yet he was a chief tax collector. Which says a couple of things. Many things really. But, but number one, a chief tax collector would have had plenty of dollars. He, as we'll see here in a moment, he was a child of Abraham, yet he had, in a sense, betrayed the children of Abraham by working for Rome to tax or to collect tax from the Jewish people. And because he was a Jew, he had some inside information on who might have the most and where to get from whoever. And know that he would, in a sense, know maybe some families and some, okay, these are of the tribe of this and the tribe of this, and these guys have this and they have this. And so I know how to tax them or collect maybe a little extra. And so he is a chief tax collector, the chief, in other words, the leader of the tax collectors, which if you were a Jew, you hated, despised tax collectors, especially if they were a Jew because they were brothers that betrayed you and in a sense, filled with yeah, sin. Wow, there's just a lot going on here. But yet, yet, it's interesting how he had everything, but he was still looking. Don't ever underestimate whether or not somebody is hungry for the Lord. Well, they're doing this, and they're, they had a, they're out partying last night, and they're not doing this. And uh, You think Zacchaeus might have had a party? I don't know. We know that Jesus is like, hey, I want to come to your house for a party here just in a moment. So his house was known for parties. Jesus said, hey, I want to come to your house for a party. I, I, who knows? What was he doing? I, I don't know, but here's what he was doing. He was looking. He was looking for somebody and someone someone to bring something to him that he couldn't access on him by himself. And he says this, he uh, <clears throat> says he wanted to see Jesus, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So there was all kinds of people, and I, you could say it like this, he was crowded out. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you haven't. I remember as a young man, just being... Knowing the state of my sin. That's one thing that's interesting. Um, all of creation, the Bible tells us that they know uh, there's a God. Did you know you don't have to tell creation right or wrong either? Did you know no, everyone knows their own stink? They're very aware of where, they're very aware. And so he was, here's, here's Zacchaeus, he's kind of crowded out. Everybody, well, all the good people are there. I don't have all my stuff together. I can't come to church. I can't. The play, I, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. The first thing to even go to the throne, you have to recognize you need help, number one. But like sometimes you just feel like, I can't go because of this, 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 and this. But your heart is crying out. Let us not be the one that's crowding out but instead inviting in. I wonder if G... Yeah, let's keep reading here. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was going to be coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down from there or come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I got to go to your house. So here's this invitation. He's, here's the crazy thing. He's inviting himself. I love this. This is a completely different look. He's like, I'm coming over. Come on, I'm coming to your house. This is, I'm coming to your house. Like, to my house? Yeah. He's like, but there's stuff laying on the counter that, from last night that you don't, he's like, hey, I know, I'm coming. <laughs> While you were yet sinners, God sent his son Jesus to die for you. With that on the counter, with that in that bathroom, with that hidden in your center console, with whatever it is that's behind the covers, while you were yet that, he said, hey, come on down from there. You're not crowded out. I'm looking. I'm calling you by name because I'm coming to your house today. I've been in your house. I've been, stand, I've been there looking, 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 looking. You've been crying out, crying out. And here I'm saying, I'm here and I'm coming. 
And only you can give me no. Only you can give me no for your answer. Only you can give me no for your answer. I know all about that. I know I'm coming. Only you can give me no for your answer. He doesn't say, and you can't give me. No, he says, only you can give me no. And here's what it goes on. He says, hey, how many people do you think saw? Oh, well, there's Zacchaeus. If deer see things in trees, you know, like they'll be walking, everything's cool, and all of a sudden they look up and like, how did you see me up here? <laughs> people would notice somebody hanging out of a tree. And they weren't like, hey, come on over here to Jesus. They're more like, come on, let's scurry along. Are you going to stop and talk to him? And you're going to go to his house? Let's look at what's going on. Oh, let's finish verse 5. When Jesus had reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Next verse. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, me? Oh, I was like hoping. And, and he, so he, what is he, why is he in the tree? Let's, let's make sure, because he's looking. I, he's looking for Jesus. But the whole time, did, we see that Jesus was actually looking for him. As soon as he got there, he was like, I mean, he could have walked that way. He could have walked that way. He could have took a left. He didn't know that he's for sure going to get, he could have took a left at, at, the, at, the, at the corner. But no, because Jesus was on his way, and when he stopped there, he said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I've been looking for you. I'm coming to your house today. And he came down, welcomed him immediately, gladly. Here's what the next verse says, though. And all the people saw this, and they began to mutter, He is going to the, be the guest of a sinner. Do you ever st- stop your approach to what your heart is crying for? Because of a crowd? And Jesus, did you know the crowd didn't stop Jesus? <laughs> That's amazing. The crowd often stops us, but the crowd didn't stop Jesus. Here he comes, and he, he comes all the way, and, and, and he's like, I'm coming to your house today. I don't care what they say in these Pharisees and these Sadducees and this guy right here. I don't care what they say. I'm coming to your house today. I'm not even giving them room to talk here. And then everybody else starts talking and muttering, can you believe that? Can you believe that? Who do you think? I've been following him for this many years. And it, Just keep going. Verse 8. We're going to go through verse 10. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord. So now he's... Now he's on his way, might, might even be approaching the house, right? Might be in the house. And he, Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, look, look. Here's what this is just proof. People's own heart. Jesus didn't tell him anything. Jesus didn't tell him anything. People's own heart. When they receive something gladly, when, they, when you say, hey, bud, can you, grab, can you take out the trash? And they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then they get, they get the trash, and there's some more stuff in the bottom. They grab that out, too, and they get the bag, and they put it in there, right? And they might, you know, wipe something down. But when you're like, bro, you're supposed to take out the trash. Can you take out the trash? I told you that like 16 times. Stupid. Why? Because it was an ask with an expectation. But when it's not an ask with an expectation, but it's just simply an ask, and you choose to do something with your own heart, there's actions. So I guess here's the question for you. Did you come to Christ on your own free will? Are you gladly following Christ this morning? Or is it just so you don't have to experience death? That's a big question, isn't it? Like, why? Why? Like, do I really see what he's done for me and how he paid a price that I owed and that I didn't come to him? He came to me and drew me. And when he got to the tree where everybody else would have said, no, you, because I know me, he looked up and he said, hey, Nate, Come, come on down from there. Come down. Because I got something. I want to come to your house. I want to eat with you. 
I want to hang with you. Yeah, but yeah, 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 but yeah. He's like, yeah, I know. I know all about that. That's why I came. Let's look at this. So he still got, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, I will pay them back four times the amount. Next verse. Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house. There was a fruit because salvation came. There was a fruit because somebody opened their heart gladly to the Lord. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. He brought him in. He said, this man, I'm calling him. Y'all disowned him. He's not even one of us. He's a tax collector. He's not even one of ours. He doesn't, you're not worthy to be called. And he makes this declaration in front of the, in front of the whole crowd. Isn't that awesome? Jesus said something about him. Everyone else was saying, he's worthless. He's this. He's, but here he's making a statement to the whole crowd that he is a son of Abraham. Hey, y'all think you're sons of Abraham? Let me tell you, this man is a son of Abraham. You know what they, in a sense, said? This is a righteous man. Y'all think you're righteous and holy and all this kind of stuff? And somebody that came in smelling like sin, and he said, this man right here, this is mine, and he's righteous because of what I did. And then the next verse, here's what he said. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I can tell you this, you're not saved if you weren't lost. If you weren't lost, you're not saved. If you weren't lost, you're not saved. Oh, come on. No. That's what this says. He came to seek and save the lost. If I have to convince you that you need Christ, you can't be saved yet. Until you see. Until you see. So you can choose. Otherwise, I can just do something to give an invitation with an expectation to manipulate you to get you off my back or to get mom off the back so that I come to church or whatever and try to do what I'm supposed to do in church in front of mom instead of every part of my life. God doesn't, God wants you to be real. The same place. Everywhere. Don't put on the show. That's where there's no power and where God can't move. Enough of the show. Let's just have the real, the real, the real cry and doing again of the things that you did first when you believed because you saw I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but he made me to see. I had no hope, but I've been lifted out of a pit and then set my feet on a rock. The good news found me when I was hopeless. Wow, there's just something that changes. And we get, we hyper, somehow we hyper aware uh, and we look to the outside when God doesn't look that way. Matter of fact, he tells us, let's go there. He says, no longer do we regard someone according to the flesh. I'm gonna, it's way down here, so um, I don't even know if I have it in my notes still. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20, it's way at the bottom. So from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Did you know, as a church, too often we're looking at the outside? And that's also, here's the cool thing, like I love the testimony that Victor came up here and shared. He was saying and making a statement not based on what he saw. Because when my eyes are fixed on what I see, doubt will rule. I'll doubt that God is reaching my kids right now because look what they're doing. Instead, I realize that God is, God is at work. And he's, you know what he's doing? He's reaching. He's teaching. He's reaching. And he's teaching. He's reaching. All of a sudden, something changes. I realize that, wait, while I was lost, God was reaching for me just like, Ooh, that's, that changes everything. You know what also changes? It, it, it changes my invitation. Because now it's no longer, I'm going to only invite those that have something together. I invite somebody that looks completely disinterested. Because I'm not looking based upon, with these eyes. I, instead, I'm looking with the eyes of my heart and re- recognizing how, how God found me. Look at, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. So from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. 
Although we once regarded Christ also in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God. All of this who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Next verse. And that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting. Why, why, why do we hold away? Because for t- far too long, the church has been counting. We are hyper aware of the outside. The Hebrew people were hyper aware of the outside. And they're counting how many times in this and this. Even when you've got to forget, well, how many times? How many times? Because they're counting. They're always counting what you did, what you didn't do. What... And God's like, I'm not counting. I'm not counting sin because why do I count something that's been paid for? I don't even think about, do I have enough money to pay for that anymore? Because it's been paid for. Once you pay a bill, you're not wondering, is there enough money in the checking account? Are you? No, you've already paid for it. It's been paid for. He said, and this is the only way you and I will carry the message of what we're talking about today. Wow. Is that God's not counting people's sins against them. But instead, and he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. Saying, hey, God loves you. Wherefore, therefore, we are Christ's sent ones. We're to be carrying the same message that found us. And again, unless you were lost, we're, we're therefore Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. Just come back to God. He's looking for you. He loves you. He's, he's, uh, he's been walking by. As a matter of fact, I'm here today to tell you God loves you. And he loves you so much that he paid a price for you. And by sending his son Jesus... To pay for your sins, past, present, and future. Yes. No. Yes. Hebrews chapter 9. Listen, he doesn't have to go in day and day and day. No, what he's doing today, the Bible says, he is interceding on our behalf. No, it doesn't say he made intercession. It says he is interceding or he makes intercession. That is a now word. God is, that's what he stands to do. No longer does he stand to make a sacrifice. Now he stands interceding on your behalf, saying, I paid the price for that. I paid the price for this. You don't, I paid the price for that. Father, the blood, the blood, the price is paid. The price is paid. That's, that's what Jesus is doing today. He's making intercession on behalf of us. Thank you. Wow. That, that's just God. So Zacchaeus was looking for him, but you know what he did? He saw God in Jesus. And somehow we have this disconnect between God and Jesus. Like Jesus is the son of God, but no, Jesus is God the son. Jesus is not the son of God. Jesus is God the son. Like, there's no difference. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we wonder, but like, here, here's, uh, um, look at this. It's like uh, John 14, verse 9. Jesus said unto him, uh, have I been with you such a long time, and, and yet you do not know me? Philip, he, he asked this to Philip. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, I think this is the picture sometimes of the church. We can be with we, can, we think God has God the Father instead of God the Son, like they're on two different ways. Well, God loves me, but, or Jesus loves me, but God is out to get me. Though it's God the Father and God the Son. Have I been with you so long? Has Jesus been preached so long that you, you and I are struggled to come or trying to hide something when Jesus, like, have I been with you so long? I, uh, well, are you just preaching a, a condoning the sin? I'm preaching a, uh, the message of Christ's love for you and me. That it's the goodness of God that led any, you and me to turn in any way. Otherwise, all you have is rags. So he was looking for him, but he saw God in Jesus. He saw 
God. And here's what he saw. He saw Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8. What then will we, I, I had a response to this, and I had a response to this, and I had a response to this. What, what do I say? Romans, I'm going to start in verse 31, Romans 8, 31. What shall we say in response to these things? God is for me. That's crazy. You don't know, like, how can God be for me? Everyone else is against me. God is for me. He saw, Zacchaeus saw, I don't know what your testimony is, but that's what I heard when I, when I found Christ as a young man. I heard, God's for me. He's not against me. I've been trying to get on his side. I've been trying so hard to get on his side, but I always fail to get on his side. He's like, what are you talking about? I've always been for you. I've always been. Uh, this whole time. Yeah, but, yeah, so you don't have a response. So we'll, we'll, God, if God is for us, who can be against us? He, he didn't spare his own son, but he gave him up for all, or for us all. How will he also not, along with him, freely give us all things? Who will bring any charge against you or against God's elect? Who's going to bring a charge against you? It is God the one that's justifying. Who's going to bring the charge? Who is there to condemn us? For Christ. Who is there? No one. Who's condemning you? The, the accuser only, Satan. Christ isn't condemning you. No one. Christ, Jesus who died? No, he paid. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also, what is he doing right now for us? Interceding. Wow. Thank you, Lord. This is what's happening. When you are looking for Jesus, re remember this. Jesus is looking for you. And when he's looking for you, and when you see him, and you, you'll see this, that God is for you, he's not against you. He's not counting. Here's what he, he's looking for. Not, just, not, is he, not only not counting, he's actually interceding before you on your behalf. To the Father, God. He is interceding for us. Wow, that's so good. Huh. Let me read that out of the King James, or out of the new, new Good News translation, rather. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus. He died. He was raised again. He's instead pleading with God for us. Pleading with like, oh, can you have you ever had so? Please. Plead, like, just, like, you know, a plead. That's amazing. But not pleading because God and him are on a different page. Pleading as in dis declaring a case. What do you plead? Not guilty. Paid for. That's the plead. That's the plead. He says something about you and me. He says something about the world that we rarely say about ourselves or about them. And as, although I am no longer a sinner just saved by grace because I am in Christ and now I am made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it would do us good to remember that we were a sinner saved by grace. And only through him were we made the righteousness of God in Christ. He loves you. He loves me. He loves me. Listen to this. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is able to also to save forever those who draw near to God. How, how long? Wow. You mean, you mean I, 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 I was saved, but I've been kind of living not saved, and my heart's been uh, this whole time, and I'm like, I can't come back, and the whole time my heart's going like this, uh, because the Lord's like, hey, buddy. Hey, hey I'm right here. Hey, I'm right here. Hey, I'm right here. This, this is why your heart is, he, he says this, he, he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he is always or always lives to make intercession for them. It's interesting. It's kind of like we can go to scripture after, this is what Jesus is doing, interceding on your and my behalf. There will never be a, there will never come a time when Jesus' work of intercession will end for you. When you're born again, never does it, is there come a time 
that his intercession ends. Matter of fact, the Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags. So even while we think we got it righteous and we're doing it right, and we're doing it good, you know, dressed up Easter Sunday, hey, brother. <laughs> you know, he's, he's standing interceding for us. Wow. Thank you, Lord. And I need that intercession. Micah 7, 19 says this, sins, the sin, our sins have been cast into the sea. You again have compassion on us. You, tread, you will tread our sins underfoot. You'll hurl all of the iniquities. This is what you, your sins, when he talks, what, it, what he's paid for them, what is he talking about? What sins? One, one, one person calls this sea the sea of forgetfulness. He says, Micah chapter 7, 19, Psalms 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he takes your sin. How far? How far is the east from the west? So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Paid for. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins how, as long as no more. It's just no more. No more. Why? Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. This is why. Having canceled the charge, having made the payment of our legal indebtedness. This was all legal. Which stood against us, stood against all, condemned us, condemned all. He has taken it away. What did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. You know what he said? It's been paid. And I paid for it at the cross. I paid for you at the cross. So stop trying to pay again what I've paid for. This is the message of the gospel. That God so loved the world that he sent his only son Jesus to pay the price. That if anybody would believe in him, if anyone would believe in him, they shall not perish but have everlasting life. For I did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save the world. That's the message of the gospel. And it's why it rings so true in the celebration of Jesus and the fact that he's risen from the dead is one that should be expressed in our hearts more than just in some clothes. God, thank you. You know where I've been. You know what I've done. You know why I haven't come. But you're calling me. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for looking up. Thank you for sharing with me, calling my name today again. You know, this message of the gospel, it's not just for, again, like the Romans or the dirty sinner. It is for all. All who were lost and saved. So this message is so powerful. And, it, and truly, Revelation chapter uh, 3, I'm gonna, I want to read this and bring this to a close this morning. Revelation 3, 14, these are the words uh, to the angel or to the pastor, the church of the last city, he writes, these are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true, the ruler of God's creation. Verse 15, so I know your deeds, that they're neither hot or cold. I wish they were either one or the other. So be, isn't that interesting? That God could wish that you were cold? Why would God wish that you were cold? So that you could find him. Wow. I wish you were cold. Because then you would see the state that you're in. And then, then when he comes, it wouldn't be like, yeah, I'm busy. He says... You say I'm rich, I have, verse 17, you say I'm rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich, white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, a slave to put on your eye, a salve, excuse me, to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. This is the context of that verse. 
God knocks on the hearts of the church all the time. The same way he still intercedes on their behalf. This right here, no matter where you're at, no matter how long you've walked with Christ, if you haven't walked with Christ, if you are falling away from Christ or you're first hearing the message of the gospel and you're saying, you know what, I want, I, I want to answer that without manipulation, without any of that. I want to give my life to Christ. I just want to simply say, I know Jesus, you're Lord. I call you Lord of my life. This is the message of Jesus. Pay the price for you and me, and he's still knocking. He's still knocking on doors. He's knocking on doors here. He's knocking on doors and giving to you and me a ministry, a message of reconciliation, which simply says this, come back to God because Jesus made a way for you and me so that you could cry out to him and call on him and he'd be a very present help in time of need. For you, not just Pastor Nate, but you, wherever you're at, whatever's going on, that you would call and he would answer. Because of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, this, we're going we're gonna to stand this morning. I want to receive communion and then uh, give an invitation to Christ. I think um, for me, this message... Uh, It was for this house. It was for the people that would be here today. I had a lot of things on my notes in different places. I was even this morning just trying to play the Tetris game. And the Lord said, I know who will be there. I know who will be there. Just rest. Just rest in this. Just let it kind of like, it, it took me a minute just to say, okay, okay, okay. Because you're not going to follow that anyway when you get up there. <laughs> but this message, as I was praying in the Spirit, just praying and just said, Lord, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? What do you have to say? He said, I, I have the same thing to say to them as I've been saying to you. I'm still knocking. I'm still drawing. There's, there's moves, there's doors that you and I have closed in our hearts to him that we've maybe been in the house a long time that he's saying, hey, let me in there. There's some that never made Jesus the Lord of your life. There's some that you've been out and you're ashamed. You're just here today, but you're, you, you're so, you've been filled with shame. But let me tell you, not from God. And so I just, this message was truly was for me. It was one that said, Lord, I'm answering the door. Places that you've been knocking, you know, kind of saying, he's drawing me over here. I'm going to answer that call. So this is a, and I'm going to give an invitation for, to Christ, to follow Christ this morning, uh, to follow him fully as Lord. And that you would say this morning that Jesus is my Lord. You believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You believe that, but you would just say, Jesus, I call you Lord of my life. You direct my life. Amen? Amen. So if, if, you, if that's you this morning, you say, are saying, God, I, I just want to give you the right to direct my life. Uh, there's been places I've closed off to you, and even this message this morning, it found me, and, and I know I'm to open, open that area up to you. Or maybe you're here this morning and you are giving Jesus uh, your life for the first time. Or maybe you're just saying, I haven't come back because I didn't know how to. And I'm just saying, come. And you say, I want to come. I just want you to lift both hands with your, with, if that's you, just right, right, just like this. And just say, Father, thank you this morning. Just tell him, Father, thank you for sending Jesus for my sins, for payment for me. Today, I declare mm, by free will, unmanipulated, uncontrolled, you, Jesus, are my Lord. Lead my life. 
for your glory. Thank you for paying the price for all of my sins and for interceding on my behalf continually. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we have a a cup that represents his blood and a cracker where these things are not very good. (laughs) But it represents the body. And the Bible says that when we take communion, we are actually proclaiming the death, the payment of Jesus until he comes. The next time you fall into a place of sin or I I challenge you to take communion. You say, oh, don't do it unworthily. You know what unworthily is? Unworthily is this, that you are looking at your merits and you're looking at your works to bring you justification to stand before a throne. Well, the only thing that can make you stand is the blood of Jesus, the the death of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can make you stand. When you proclaim that, what happens is something changes. You see love uh, move from the heart. Uh, Lukewarmness washes away, and you turn back to Christ. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you that you said on the night that that you were betrayed that you took uh, bread and you broke it, and you said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Lord, this today, uh, we thank you that you took your stripe, our stripes upon your back so that we could be healed, spirit, soul, and body. And so right now, as we declare that, we also receive that as we eat of your bread. We break it, and we eat of it, and we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. You're so good. And we thank you that you, after that you took a cup, and you said, I'm going to make a new agreement, a new covenant, a new arrangement with you, and it's going to be based on my blood. That this blood is a payment for your sins. It's payment. And so, Father, we just lift this to you and we say thank you for the payment that we couldn't pay. And we just say we trust you today for our salvation. We trust you for our salvation. For my salvation, I trust you and I receive your finished work on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we just rejoice because we have so much to rejoice about today. Jesus is alive. He's alive. Jesus, you're alive. And you're alive in this house. You're alive in my family. You're alive in my heart. Jesus is alive. And we say thank you today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. Jesus is Lord. And then next week, if you want to, you know, I'm just going to, I was thinking about what we're going to be sharing about. I was going to do a series on preaching Jesus. Everyone, everywhere, every day, because that's what we're doing. But um, the Lord just arrested my heart this week as I was getting ready for this message. And we're going to start a series on whole family. Uh, It's going to be a series on family, whole family. So good news, family. You know what a whole family has? They have good news in their heart. They, a whole family. But so it's marriage and family, parenting, all these kind of things. Just having a whole family because you have God's help in this world. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.